Okay, I'm gonna have to turn off the volume on Facebook. Great, so um, let me tell everyone that I am managing editor Erica Ruby of Leonardo, and I'm here welcoming Dr. Charlotte Frost in discussion today. Uh, Dr. Frost is Executive Director of Furtherfield, London's longest running art and technology center. She's a BA, PG, DIP, MA, and PhD in art history, contemporary and digital arts, and digital culture. She has over 20 years experience in art research, publishing, curation, education, management, communications, and marketing. Uh, she is the author of Art Criticism Online, A History, and her article, Digital Critics, The Early History of Online Art Criticism, is the free download in this month's Leonardo Journal. So in this article, which you can get online, and I've posted the link to the Facebook live stream, and I'll put it now here in Zoom so everybody can read it. Um, so we are live broadcasting now through Zoom. We have some uh, viewers there, and we are on Facebook. Anyone who's on Facebook, I encourage you to add to the conversation. Um, we will be continuing the conversation about this article and the discussion um, as long as we are able to host it, and fingers crossed that this works. This is the very first time that we are having a Reader's Club live stream uh, through Leonardo, so please bear with us if there are technical difficulties. Um, seems to be working so far, but thank you. Let me join um, everyone in welcoming Dr. Frost today. So, hello. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be your guinea pig uh, <laughs> and uh, to have this opportunity to talk to people about this research and this project, especially as I can see people in attendance who were really foundational to this history. So it feels like an exciting opportunity. So uh, let me say, can you tell us a little bit about your research, uh, how you came to write the article? Yeah, so um, so as you said in the introduction, um, I have a history um, in art historical studies and very much in contemporary and digital. So when I was doing my master's and my PhD, I was really focusing on uh, digital and new media arts and the history of um, that era, really from the 1950s and uh, from the 1950s onwards. And then um, I really became interested in the discussion forums and the spaces that had supported the online production of art, but had also been the spaces in which people had created the, the context and the um, communities that produced innovative online projects or early pieces of digital work. And I realized that I had participated in some, but I also was aware that there were many that had existed before I was researching in the field. And one thing I found was that uh, it was quite difficult to research um, the forums if you hadn't participated in them. It's not always a really clear interface for the discussions that have occurred. Even if there's an archive, there's not always an easy way in. Certainly from um, mailing list culture onwards, you'd often get like a, a dis discussion thread and things would happen in that discussion thread that weren't necessarily kind of indexed somehow. So I knew I was coming up against problems in my own research into the history of digital and new media art. And then I just became really interested in this as a field. What does an art critical space look like when it's happening online? How does that relate to the broader history of art criticism? And then I was interested in kind of two provocations or prompts. So on the one hand, what might be described as the plight of the American art critic. So um, when I was working uh, in a uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, I got very close to worked a lot with their local art critic, Mary Louise Schumacher. And she and I had a lot of conversations about how, um, how many job losses there were in the field of art criticism across the US. And at the time, and until incredibly recently, she was the full-time art critic for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And she had been working on a documentary and kind of chronicling these job losses. So I was really interested in what, what was happening, whether or not there was a crisis of art criticism. 
Um, and then I was interested in the fact that alongside those job losses was this like mass proliferation of online art criticism. So much. Um, Jerry Saltz was commenting on the fact there was so much. James Elkins uh, in his book about art criticism had said really he felt the crisis was um, that there was so much art criticism and it was hard to really filter that. Um, and here in the UK, uh, Gilda Williams um, has a book about art criticism and has written a number of articles kind of analysing the field. And she, she was really seeing it as like an expansion of art criticism, like an explosion. So for me, the research was unpacking what had happened before, what were the early examples of art criticism, how that had changed over time. Um, and understanding what that looked like in terms of is there a crisis and is that crisis um, characterized by job losses or is it characterized more by the production of new and different um, or innovative types of art criticism and really also how different are they? <laughs> mm -hmm. So how different are the contemporary social media based forms of art criticism from um, earlier pieces that happened really in the 1980s. So the, this article is part of a much bigger piece of research. I can drop in, I'm just gonna stick in a, a link to the chat. So um, my book is out in a couple of weeks time. And that is a, that's a, an attempt to provide an interface to the history of online forms of art criticism. And that looks at some of these earlier stages that I've looked at here more specifically for Leonardo, and then it comes right through to more contemporary forms. Um, and within that, that's where I start to trace what I see as these kind of three different waves of online forms of art criticism. And this article is very much about that first foundational, really important wave. So how would you characterize that first wave of art criticism? Yeah, so, um, so I think it's a really interesting field because I think for some of us, it's hard to imagine if you weren't there, you don't know what it looks like because we're so used to contemporary social media that those earlier web spaces, unless you can see images of them or have descriptions, it, it's hard to kind of, um, to visually characterize them and then when it's hard to visually characterize them I think it's hard to understand what the space would have been like to uh, interact with. But for me one of the ways of characterizing that earlier period is that it seems there's a lot of connection with um, alternative art spaces from 1960s, 1970s um, and onwards where you know we saw particularly in places like New York and in uh, areas of California um, a huge kind of proliferation of new independent smaller edgier uh, artist-led spaces arriving and so I think the most important thing to say initially about this like early um, history of online art criticism is that it really connects to that desire to find new spaces to create new spaces for art discussion for art practice for art community building that I guess maybe mirrored or paralleled the the physical spaces that, that people were operating in but also really mirrored and paralleled the ethos of that era the idea that you wanted to operate independently from perhaps big museums and also in this instance to operate independently from arts magazines because by the time in the 1980s by the time these platforms are being established um, publications like Art Forum were, were also really established. So they were kind of really setting the, the bar for what a contemporary arts publication could be. And lots of people were expecting that approach to art criticism, that, that plush look, that um, very highly designed um, kind of um, elevating concept you know like this idea of publishing a magazine that looks really high-end and expensive and that really also driving the market and I think you know at this time in the 1980s a lot of people were interested in uh, being independent precisely because it could take them out of that um, 
uh, commercial art loop. And so these were also independent spaces where people could just make stuff and talk about stuff and not be tied into what is the object, what is the um, unique item that we're going to sell, but rather more what is the community we can build and how can we push artistic practice in different directions by building this community in a new space, by developing new forms of practice that uh, exist within these spaces and how can that support uh, relationships offline and practices offline you know like what's the uh, what's the connection between the two so for me it's really characterized by that um that alternative space that desire to be independent and the need to create communities or extend communities so that new types of practice could evolve and new types of relationships could evolve online. So this is the, the first wave, as you see it, of online art criticism. We're now currently in the third. Um, the third I see is uh, largely or incorporate social media and the ability of art critics and readers to have a conversation with one another. Um, did the second wave have that in common or does it differ? Can you describe a little bit what the second wave of online art was? Yeah, so for me, the second wave, I mean, it was, I'm, I'm artificially creating these categories. And the reason I'm doing it is because I want to provide a way to, to handle the different characteristics and to try and collect um, certain examples together. But that always, I mean, it's a very art historical thing to do, but there's an artificial element to that. And so, I want to say that that's my framework in order to handle the discussion of those, but it's, uh, it's a blurry line. Um, with the second wave, I really just separated it out because it seemed like there was enough of a shift between some of those earlier spaces um, of course, some of them had, had, some of the earlier spaces had already, um, I don't want to say died out because actually the communities that they built were still very strong. But some of the earlier spaces that I write about in the article, perhaps through um, the upgrade of different technologies, were not necessarily being as used as much as they had been or weren't as functional as they had been. And really, in the mid 1990s, you get the uh, listserv or the mailing list, um, and so you get that automation of discussion. And then, you know, like particularly around 1997, you have this real peak year for artists using uh, listservs to produce online discussion. And so, for me, the second wave is, is both characterised by list serves as a platform but also by a real uh, sense of collective criticism so it's kind of the coming of age of that earlier period um it's the it's the taking on of all of the developments that had already been um created and then the moving into the list of discussion space and then the expansion of those audiences and it's also then characterized i think around uh, this desire to be really critical about digital culture and so a lot of the examples of second wave um, forms of online art criticism if you think about um, listservs like Rhizome or like NetTime or the Syndicate in Europe they were spaces for art discussion but they were also very much spaces for a critique of this unfolding culture of uh, the digital of um, online uh, life so something that we're much more used to in the mainstream now you know what what day passes that there isn't an article in a newspaper about what social media means to our lives but mailing list culture was really an, an early space for taking on a lot of those debates but embedding them within the artistic practice that was happening also at the time and i would say that that also connects that second wave with a real sense of institutional critique. And that's not to say that it wasn't present in early forms of online art criticism. Of course it was, it was present in our text, it was present in ASAN. But I think what happens really by the time you get to listservs and mailing list culture is uh, projects that exist within those spaces or net art projects that connect with the discursive spaces 
that are very much about critiquing concepts like art galleries, concepts like art history in particular. I mean, internet art really fights back against the idea of art history in a lot of ways. And so you end up with this uh, kind of layered space where the critique of digital culture and then the critique of art history are happening together in and around a lot of these really intense discursive environments. And, I, and it's also where you get the first real um, difficult waves of trolling. So, um, of course, you have disputes in spaces uh, you have them all the time but what you start to get in mailing this culture is um, deliberate kind of acts of flaming uh, you also get people deliberately using pseudonyms in particular creative ways so by the time you move to social media you're it's a different type of trolling actually in a way it's not always such a creative approach to trolling but um yeah i would say that's another important characteristic of the of the second wave this deliberate use of trolling so you have people or entities like luther blissett um who was a, a fictitious uh, artist project and then you have nn which was um a collective another collective identity known for a lot of trolling in around mailing list spaces believed to be the originator of um a certain type of software and believed to be a certain person but um also very capable of shutting down discussion in mailing list space by just spamming and relentlessly flaming people within that environment do you think that that has a um situation continues into the current wave or has that kind of tempered a bit? No, I mean, it does, it does continue. But I mean, it continues, gosh, it continues differently. I think, I think there are two ways of looking at this. I mean, when I was doing the, doing the research for the book, uh, when I was researching mailing list culture, um, people got in touch with me a lot to, with very polarized perceptions actually on, some of those trolling experiences and some people seeing them as incredibly um, exciting, critical, innovative uh, practices and some people just saying you know this this destroys lives, it broke down communities, it made life incredibly hard. Um, you see that destruction of lives or you certainly see the intensity in um, in social media trolling definitely in and around the arts. I think we know more about it now. So I think we sometimes are able to protect ourselves better or there are more opportunities to reach out for support. So I think in early mailing list culture, when people had built those spaces themselves, really literally built them, um, and they got destroyed or they at least got, um, massively disrupted i think that it was incredibly hard to um to deal with that but i think now it's possible sometimes because we know that cyberbullying and trolling are things that uh, we might be able to take uh, precautions to protect ourselves or or get a little bit of space but to be honest with you no i mean it still it still happens to a huge degree i i look at in the book um uh, Ellie Harrison, uh, a British artist who produced a work um, uh, called The Glasgow Effect a few years ago and it was a deliberately provocative work but the, I mean almost now you could think that the artwork itself was the trolling that she received because it's endless, I mean to archive all of the trolling she received would, would be a book in itself um, and uh, it would have been incredibly distressing. Some of the things that were written about her were incredibly personal, and as uh, that's your artistic practice, I think you know, had it have been me, I think it would have been horrific. So yeah, it still exists. I'm sure it carries the same the same level of distress. Um, I think it can be slightly less tactical these days, and a little bit more just people being mean for no reason. Um, but yeah, I hope that we know a little bit more about it now that we can do more to support each other in those situations at least. So early on, um, 
online art criticism filled a vacuum and it allowed people to have a conversation in real time. Uh, these days we have an information flood. And as you mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities for people to participate in positive or in negative ways. Um, though it can sometimes be hard to reach an audience or to be heard in those um, conditions. And do you have uh, anything to say about that trajectory and what it means for online criticism? Yeah, I mean, I tend to think that if you are writing quality work, um, that, that really does engage with the art that's out there in the world. You will find an audience and you will, you will interact with that audience. What we don't have currently is much of a model for how you can monetize that. So, you know, the, the real difficulty we have is how you, can you make a living? as an art critic online um, and then that is if you can't it's not wildly different from the origins of art criticism because most early journalistic art critics um, from a couple of hundred years ago were were part-time were freelance um, you know they were doing it in connection with a lot of other jobs or practices so the real issue is, is can you survive doing it? Can you feed yourself doing it? And right now, quite possibly not. There are, there are business models that support it to a certain degree, but I think, it's, I think it's like a creative practice that has to at least initially be supported by other paid work so that you have the opportunity to build an audience. Mm -hmm. But in terms of quality, there's a huge amount of quality practice out there. There's a huge amount of quality art writing, but there's also really interesting um, multimedia work, um, work that's a lot more uh, perhaps expanded. It's not just a, a blog post critique of an existing art project, but it might be a response to that, which could be performative. It could be a work of fiction. It could be, um, a video broadcast so I think the audience can be found and I think that there's still a really strong audience for our critical work actually I think we we in the arts field get really excited about discovering new uh, art critical practice and it can exist in a variety of different places I mean um, an example in the book is uh, American art critic uh, Brian Dracour and he uh, used the Yelp platform and wrote less kind of uh, art criticism of actual artworks and more reviews of art experiences so really using Yelp how, how Yelp is supposed to be used but for like a gallery experience and um, I mean obviously that got shared once people discovered he was doing it, he was doing it, it got shared on other social media platforms but they're really interesting pieces of writing uh, and they definitely found their audience. So yeah, there's a huge volume of work out there. Yes, it can be hard to find an audience perhaps initially, but certainly easy to, to build up towards one, particularly if you write for now an existing platform like Hyperallergic, um, who have really great reach, of course. But can you make money off it? Mm, that one's harder. <laughs> So uh, to contrast the multimedia type of publishing that you just discussed, uh, the early online um, <clears throat> platforms were text-based. There was no formatting. I don't know if there was available availability to link to anything. How did it work for people to discuss works of art that they couldn't see through these platforms? Mm. So that's where we would need to uh, bring in lots of people who participated at the time to give really good examples of what that would have looked like for them within the space. I mean, certainly for some of these platforms, they had shared contexts. So um, it might be that you were all based uh, loosely around certain geographical areas. So you would have been more familiar with the work that's being discussed. The other thing was that as those platforms got expanded into um, ways of sharing different forms of practice, then it might be that you could also um, provide more information about what the art was like to experience and it might eventually be that you could provide uh weak graphics um you know because you could uh 
put things in the mailboxes for people to download. But I also think that that's part of what was going on in these spaces. The, the, I've described it in, in the book as this kind of like collective discussing back and forth where you're really through a process of describing, you're actually also really getting into a critique because it's hard to ever critique an artwork without being part of the rigorous description of what it looks like and actually not being able to see it and having that conversation with somebody who can see it or can tell you about it forces them to tell you more about it, forces you to ask certain questions which starts to expand the discussion that way. Um, but I also think that one of the things that's lacking in, in my research and certainly in the book are examples of what those discussions would have looked like um, around a work that wasn't present or that not enough of the people in the discussion had seen. But then in all of these spaces, what people were always doing was broadcasting what couldn't be seen um, you know directly so again in all of these spaces and certainly it happens in in mailing list culture a lot as well is a you're not here in this particular physical locality so let me tell you uh, what our art scene looks like let me tell you what this practice is all about um and you know mailing list culture was also incredibly text heavy um, you had to go seek other websites and other spaces to to see examples and, and that's true of um, ASEN. I mean uh, the, the Artcom network for example as that expanded that had all sorts of resources attached to it that meant that you could see artworks in different contexts um, that there were lots of different ex lots of different creative experiences to participate in some of which um, you know were so groundbreaking at the time that we don't even really necessarily have examples of them now because we've almost regressed because of the social media platforms creating a framework via which we can put out content but of course these earlier platforms they were um you know kind of like pioneering and building or oh, what what would we want this space to look like what would we need to happen in it so in some ways although the technology was not as advanced in some ways there was an ability to be more experimental and creative in setting up those spaces and so in the course of your research what types of archives of these spaces were you able to find if any so most of the archival work i've done for uh, the book has been using uh, Rhizome's web recorder and I've been going and collecting various things. Um, there are some people have archives um, locally to themselves, which has been impossible for me to explore. So there have been, for example, Rhizome um, is missing a section of its own archive and various people told me that they did uh, have that in, in their own computers. Um, but it becomes incredibly uh, tech heavy for me to look into that. And the same is true of, you know, lots of the early spaces without being able to go and visit with somebody and dig through what they've got in existence. It's not always possible to see examples of the work. So um, certainly this book was about uh, providing a way into that and drawing attention to that fact. And hopefully, I mean, I know that there have been I mean, uh, Judy Malloy, for example, uh, she's got massive archives based at Duke. Um, there are works out there that you can get hold of uh, with, a, with a bit more travel or a bit more support. But I think it's something that needs a lot of work. It's something that we need to be investing more in. I mean, I, I know within this research that I have made certain mistakes. Um, uh, I've corrected, I think the book is now, everything is correct in the book, but um, it has been hard to have conversations with people and then loop round and round and round in terms of uh, building up an oral history and understanding everybody's sometimes slightly different version or sometimes just missing a chunk of information and having to sleuth out that missing piece of information. Um, I probably should try and put all of my research online because in addition to the book, of course, there's uh, great swathes of the discussions that I've had in various spaces. But again, it's a, a mammoth task, <laughs> so not yet. So uh, you did mention the Rhizome Web Recorder tool. Are there additional developments, positive developments that you found? 
I mean, the web recorder tool really is, is, is the main one for me because that's the one I, there are, we were using it quite early on in this research. And so we have some tidying up to do um, in our own archive for this project. But um, that's the one that's been so cleverly designed to take into account all of the differing layers of information that you might need to record. And so one of the best examples right at the start um, was, you know, if you're wanting to record something about Facebook, if you've got the fact that there are all of those layers of dynamic information, you've got likes, or now you've got, you know, different emoticons for different types of likes, and you, then you've got the different uh, timestamps for when people have interacted with something. So Web Recorder, because it was so specifically designed to handle that type of content, for me is still the strongest. Um, within my own work, I've done everything from um, screen grabs to um, meticulous spreadsheets, which are still, you know, a really great way to store things because you can do your own um, very manual data scraping and just manage to um, input lots of uh, statistics or lots of details to analyze and to code yourself. But uh, I think other tools, I mean, text text analysis tools can be really interesting. Um, in the uh, International Art English project for um, Triple Canopy a few years ago, um, the authors used a text analysis tool and that gave them a slightly slanted view of what contemporary art criticism looks like because they were looking mainly at the uh, press releases that are published via the eFlux platform. So rather than necessarily like art criticism proper, it's more somewhere between that promotional text and an art critical piece. But it did give a really interesting overview of the types of language that was being regularly used within those spaces. So um, I think those sorts of uh, analytical tools um, are also supportive of the research and the archival work. So is there anything um, that really surprised you in your research for the book or in general? Ooh, um, in terms of surprising me, um, I don't know. It, one of the hardest things is that it's vast. So one of the things, I, it didn't surprise me, but it tortured me. <laughs> the fact that, you know, there, there is so much work out there and it's incredibly hard to marshal that and provide an overview. And so, um, you know, it's daily now I get emails from people who are familiar with the fact I've been researching this area and they want to tell me about a platform that they've been running, like either within a local context or perhaps for a major institution, but it's, it's been, you know, kind of like smaller or, or less directly pioneering. And it's impossible for me to, um, you know, chronicle or archive all of these different, all of these different projects. So it, that was kind of torturous and that forced me to be really ruthless with what I kept in the book. Mm -hmm. And I suppose what would be surprising about that is that some of the recent pioneering works don't feel that pioneering or don't feel that dramatically different compared to earlier practice. Yeah, I think it, I think probably it's surprising that we had a lot of experimental work early on um, and that drove a real kind of like frenzied development of online art criticism. And now in some channels, it's become a lot more traditional again. Um, in some channels, I think the, the quite traditional, like 800 word exhibition review is now popular again. And I don't have anything against that, but when you've got all of these technological tools at your at your fingertips it seems far more interesting to me when you can create a project that uses those tools and really reflects and speaks to the work at a different level um, I'm just trying to think if anything else was surprising um, I, well I suppose the other thing that's surprising to me and really drove the research early on was that a lot of people seem to think that online art criticism had really kind of started in the mid 2000s with blogging 
And there just seemed to be so little awareness for what had been happening in the late 70s and early 80s or through the 90s. And people seem to be really trying to claim, oh, I'm the first um, online art critic with my blog from, I don't know, like 2004 and things like that. And it seemed crazy to me, actually, that there had been so much work that had provided the foundations to that and that in some ways had been more experimental and that it wasn't getting a look in. And there was a, a conference at the Walker Arts Centre in 2015, and there was very little treatment of the actual history of online art criticism. So it can be great, of course, to analyse what the practice looks like now and where it's going, but uh, it's really important to understand where it came from and you know what the threads are that have been woven throughout that connect all of these different approaches together. So the... Uh the ignorance, I suppose, of the early platforms with um, modern practitioners um, really will owe a lot, I think, to your research and to your publication about, about the history. Um, but where do you see online criticism or art criticism moving in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's always hard to predict, it's, to kind of like talk about where it would go in the future. Um, I have no doubt that there are technologies on the way that uh, I can't imagine yet. Um, I would answer that in two ways. One of the ways is that I think that um, there's work to be done and it's happening, but there's more work to be done in terms of thinking about what this... Um, the connection between like an, an outreach or a marketing practice and an art critical practice or a curatorial practice is and so I think like certainly big institutions are really keen on having uh, digital outreach projects and using social media and I don't think there's enough out there yet that's really showing what that practice could look like of its own you know um, what it might be to be a digital interpretation curator or uh, we're at early stages of that and I think that that will be greatly informed by I mean I am the executive director of Furtherfield now but their, their work has always been a real um, muse of mine because certainly in the 2000s they were producing really interesting projects that connected people around artistic discussion in quite playful ways and so I think there's space for those types of projects to be created. Um, I think um, Charmian Griffith who is based at um, Art Angel in London uh, has certainly had a hand in some really interesting um, digital work in that area but I but I do think that that slippage between like kind of the the marketing dimension and what this interpretive outreach practice should look like needs development and I think as as educators I'm not I'm not currently teaching but what I was developing when I was teaching in Hong Kong were approaches to teaching that so what does it mean to teach like a survey about criticism then to show what art criticism looks like online and then to get students being very practical in producing videos, audio guides and designing projects perhaps that they're not about to make but would, that they would like to make that would be interesting responses to work. I also think Triple Canopy is a really good example of that type of practice. The, uh, the response to existing works through a really um, creative but critically rigorous process. Um, where I, I was going to say like another, another response to that. Oh yeah, I know what I was going to say. So my other response to that would be really about where technology is going. So, um, you know, blockchain. So at the moment it seems like what on earth would blockchain do to our criticism, but I have no doubt that it will do something. And I think that something might be to do with, uh, provenance and how, uh, we can use smart contracts to connect blocks of information and to make our critical uh, output a lot more traceable. So if we think about the fact that um, a piece of art criticism works to support the financial value of an artwork, then being able to connect an artwork to all of those blocks of information 
via uh, a software uh, platform would make a lot of sense. Um, at Furtherfield, we collaborate with an organization called Artea, who are an early uh, blockchain-based art collection our collection management system and we have uh, one of the things we'll be doing with them is producing a collection of digital artworks for them within their space to help test out what the cataloging will look like for uh, media arts based practice but I have no doubt through that that work and through other developments that we'll end up with interesting models for what that type of technology can do for art criticism so in some ways it, where does art criticism go well where does the technology go and how can we how can we use it or disrupt it hack it critique it and then on the other hand what are the existing practices and where does art criticism start to combine with those existing practices so to go back to your point about um, how art marketing has such a loud voice and is so prevalent today um, to everyone, clearly art has been marketed for quite some time. Um, do you think that early art criticism was affected by such marketing? Was it just not as apparent and not as widespread as it is today? Um, in terms of art criticism being less, less visible, uh, the marketing component of having an effect on art criticism. I mean, I think that I think that they, I think the marketing and art criticism were were so much more separate before, um, because you know once we get online, lots of things are happening literally in the same space, and so I think that it's really that reconfiguration or that kind of combining that happens within the online space. Um, I think in terms of our criticism as a practice, it, it was performing such an obvious function for a big chunk of time. And then international curators started to perform a lot of the function of the art critic by either producing criticism, but also producing the critical reading by curating in certain ways and being invited to create on, on a world stage in a different way. So you know now we think about something like the the venice biennale or documenta as a, a a critical object to such a degree that art criticism people write critiques of the venice biennale of documenta of the works in it that's not to say it doesn't happen of course it does but the the actual critical work of those events has started to take over from the certainly the writerly critical work uh, and, I, and actually, I think then you could say that um, art criticism sort of suffered a, uh, a marketing problem of its own because it hasn't been maybe so clear the work that art criticism does um, within the ecosystem of the art world. So I think what happens then is that people either think that art critics are just mean people who, who write, oh, I didn't, didn't really like that and here are some reasons why, or um, that their work is less connected to the market value of the pieces. I mean, certainly that's true in the kind of Biennale sector. You, it's far more important now um, to have a work that's, that's done the Biennales than has been critiqued by an important critic. And then that meant that for many publications, the sustainability of an art critical role became really problematic because, you know, for example, they're trying to sell advertising in space. Well, art criticism is a, a niche thing to read or an increasingly niche thing to read within print space. So, yeah, I think that I think then uh, perhaps we, you know, if we could go back maybe 10 or 15 years in time. Uh, we might have done some marketing work on the concept of art criticism itself, but I'm sure it would have suffered the same fate because it's it's the same uh, fate that journalists around the world suffer with, and you know it's part and parcel of that shift. So, is there anything um, that you weren't able to fit into your book um, or into this article that you'd like to share today with the people who are watching? My goodness, like a, like a thousand things. <laughs> so many things. I mean, looking back, one of the things that, um, that I would really have liked to have done, I don't know if it's something that I would be able to do going forwards. 
I commented before we got started today that uh, Darlene Tong is uh, in the discussion space. Um, I mean, I would love to have done like a video seminar with uh, all of the people who I was researching, particularly from this earlier phase, and really have done some extensive recorded interviews and to provide perhaps an oral history or an oral archive to augment what I've produced because I've really produced like an entry point, an overview, and it and it's I'm very conscious of um, how much I've had to reduce that in order to tell this bigger story. And it's not my story to tell because, you know, I wasn't there. And so I bring an objectivity uh, as, you know, historians and researchers, we come into spaces that we didn't exist and we bring an objectivity and that allows you to ask questions that might not be so obvious when you're immersed in it. But when these projects are projects that people have built and crafted and been so involved in, their voices are so important. So uh, that, I would love to include that. Um, I think that that's, that is a, an omission. I think it would be a great thing to do. Um, I would love to uh, produce like an online um, catalogue for art critical spaces because the book itself um, and uh, the website eventually will have lists of resources but as I say people are contacting me all the time to tell me about different art critical projects and although I worked with a research team on all of this, it, there's still too much to go around and it would be great for people to be able to register those things. Um, and, you know, if I had time to help insert those into the framework that I've built or at least allow them to be categorised in certain ways so that we can see the shape of our criticism as it's growing and sprouting in different directions. Um, and I think, you know, it's, hard, it's really hard to write a book about such a dynamic topic. So there is a website, there will be more dynamic materials on the website and the book itself is, is also will be available in ebook form. But, um, you know, Web Recorder helped me in terms of being able to collect examples that had the requisite dynamism to them. But it would be great for it to have been a video book or, you know, some kind of, um, some kind of archive that provided lots and lots of layers of, of resources. As always with these things, it's an academic book. And so uh, those are still quite limited, but also you're limited by funding and research time and, and all of these other things. Yeah, the, the originary voices and the dynamism of archive would probably be top on my list of, of omissions or areas that I that I will work harder on in the future. <laughs> so what are your plans uh, for continuing your, your research and your work? So uh, I'll, first of all, I'll be rolling out on the website. When the book comes out, there'll be some teaching resources for the website. So I will be sharing some of the classes that I devised in Hong Kong that allow you to use different bits of technology to produce art critical projects and give a framework for how that work would be produced. Um, and then over the next year, I'll be uh, doing lots of talks and presentations of the book. And my intention going forwards would be really to start to dig into various uh, aspects of the work and start to be more analytical and more critical. So the, the main thing that the book and this research does is it provides that interface or that overview and it starts to lay out what a history might look like. But I'd really like to, if this doesn't sound too um, Monty Python, I would really like to think about how you critique art criticism. <laughs> so what are the art critical objects that are produced today and what are really high quality ones within a digital space. So I'd really like to start to evaluate, I mean, it, you know, it's controversial, but Jerry, somebody like Jerry Saltz is using social media platforms in a very prolific way, not in a very interesting way, perhaps, not in a very critically rigorous way. So if you compare that with a platform like Purple Canopy, they're, they're wildly poles apart. And so I think it would be really interesting the next stage to start to work out how to really write critical analyses of the objects and the practices that are out there 
and really start to create a, an evaluation of what exists. So we're uh, coming up on almost an hour of discussion. Um, I want to thank you very much for, for being here today. Is there anything more that you would like to add? No, no, I've done enough talking. <laughs> I would love to be heckled and have people add their own examples or stories or anything that's out there. Great. So we're going to uh, archive this um, conversation on Facebook and hopefully the discussion with viewers will continue. Um, I encourage you to check in as well and, and comment if you'd like and please share with, with your readers and everyone in your network as well. Um, so I want to thank all of uh, the people who viewed today for joining us. This is, as I said, our very first um, Readers Club discussion with a Leonardo author. Um, Charlotte was the author of this Digital Critics, the Early History of Online Art Criticism, free download in this month's Leonardo. I recommend that everybody uh, visit the link that is in the um, description of the video, download it, read it, share it, and please let us know what you think. So thank you very much, Charlotte, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a really great opportunity. I appreciate it. It has been a pleasure. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.